This is Radio TV Phono Nut, and today we have a little yellow and white Zenith Kitty record player from 1968. And the reason I know it's from the 68 model year is because of the the Y model prefix that designates 1968. This is a one-tube wonder record player, probably one of the last ones that Zenith made before they went to all solid state designs. And yes, I've already peeked inside. It's your typical single tube amplifier. It uses a 25EH5 tube wired in series with a 90 volt motor. It's in really nice shape for a kitty record player. Most of these are trashed by the time I find them. The only thing I really don't like about it is this chintzy plastic lid that'll fall off if you're not careful and it doesn't stay closed very well when you're carrying it. I think part of the reason for that is 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 one of these little pieces is broken off right here. It had a little piece here and a piece here to hold it shut, but as you can see, one of them's broken off. But nothing we can really do about that. And here it is. And it came with this Peter Pan Kitty record. What is this? Sing along with the grasshoppers, the chipmunk song. And the other side is Sing Along with the Grasshoppers, Little Tin Soldier, and Little Toy Drum. I'm sure that went to the top of the pop charts in the 60s. Four-speed models, 1633, 45, and 78 with a neutral position. All right, let's fire it up and see what it does. Okay, 45 power on and as you can tell it's very sluggish probably due to a gummed up motor that needs lubrication let's see if the amp does anything at least we know the tube filament's good because if the tube was burned out the motor wouldn't even turn since the tube heater is wired in series with the motor And I'm not hearing any noise from the speaker. Nothing from the cartridge, so we can assume the amp is dead. Alright, let's get it down to the workbench and see what we can do with this. And here's the underside, not much to it. Our standard alliance drive mechanism, 4 inch speaker, output transformer, our little amp chassis with our single tube, our cardboard tube filter capacitor that we know is probably bad by now. Okay, here's a better view of the chassis. By this time we had mostly switched from selenium rectifiers to silicon, although we had that little 1970-71 Imperial one tube wonder a while back that still used a selenium rectifier, but anyway this is our 150 ohm uh, dropping resistor or surge current limiting resistor. There's our silicon diode. This is our tone compensation capacitor, looks like. And this looks like our chassis isolation capacitor, which is still a wax paper job. And something a bit unusual for a single tube cheapy kitty record player, this one appears to have a a volume control with a loudness compensation tap on it, as you can see here, with a capacitor connected from the tap to ground. The purpose of that is to help boost the high, the low frequencies a little bit with, when you're listening at low volume levels. Like I said, that's unusual to see on a little cheapy kitty record player, but Zenith always seemed to try to pay attention to quality details, so I really shouldn't be too surprised coming from Zenith. Alright, let's make some voltage measurements and try to see why this amplifier is silent. Alright, let's check our DC output of the rectifier diode here. We're on the cathode. And on the meter we're getting absolutely no DC voltage at all. Okay, let's set our meter to AC. And let's check the for incoming AC going into this surge current limiting resistor. I should see the full line voltage, and I do. Let's go to the other end of the resistor that in turn connects to the anode of the diode. 
and I'm only getting 43 volts coming out of that resistor. So, the resistor is not running hot at all, and I just bust, look what I just did. Let the tube get too friendly with the speaker, and I busted the speaker cone. That's nice. So I'll have to fix that. Alright, anyway, back to our problem. There's a couple of possibilities here. Number one, this resistor is probably severely wide open and maybe passing a, passing a little voltage, but it's so high in value that it's not passing enough. Not a, and it could also be that this diode is shorted, which caused this resistor to open. I don't think anything is shorted past this diode and drawing too much current, because if it was, this resistor would be blazing hot to the touch and it's not, so let's use our own meter to check this resistor and this diode. The resistor's supposed to be 150 ohms, let's see what we have. Well, it's certainly not 150 ohms. Let's crank our meter range way up there and recheck it. We're reading 100 and, well, let's just round it up to 110,000 ohms, so yeah, for all intents and purposes, that resistor is open. Now, let's check the rectifier diode. We'll set our meter to the diode test function. Have one meter lead clipped on the anode. Now I'll touch the other meter lead to the cathode. Okay, we're not getting anything there. Let's reverse our meter lead. and recheck. If this diode's good, we should get a reading now. And we get a reading. So the diode is good. It's just this resistor is almost open. Here's the resistor out of circuit. It's reading it's supposed to be 150 ohm. It's reading 147,000 ohms. See, it kind of went up a little bit, didn't it? Okay, we checked the diode, and it's good, but let's take it a step further. We have our negative meter lead clipped to circuit ground, and I'm going to touch my positive meter lead on the cathode of the diode, which is our B-plus output. I want to make sure there's no short past this point to ground. And look at the meter. We're reading about, oh, about one ohm. So yeah, something is shorted in this amplifier, and we know it's not the 25EH5T because I removed it to keep from puncturing the speaker any worse. And when trying to find a short circuit, you want to look at everything that connects to the point where the short is located. In this case, we have our electrolytic filter capacitor. We have the primary winding of our audio output transformer. We have this tone compensation capacitor, one end connects to the plate of the output tube, and we have this resistor here that goes over to the screen grid of the output tube. Out of all of those possibilities, I'd say it's probably the filter capacitor that's shorted. Let's unsolder it and see. Okay, I snipped the red lead and loose from the filter capacitor, and look at there, no short. So, dead shorted filter capacitor, drew too much current, and cause this resistor to burn open. It's a wonder it didn't take... Okay, what was I trying to say before the camera ran out of memory? I think I was talking about the diode. Even though the original diode tested good, I went ahead and replaced it, and that was just for a precautionary measure. That's back from my days of working on lightning damaged televisions, where two of the diodes in the, in the bridge rectifier network would be shorted, but the other two would be okay. Oftentimes I'd replace the two shorted ones, apply power, and one of the ones that previously checked okay would abruptly short, most likely from being stressed out from the lightning strike, and all it took was just a, some power to be applied to them to take them the rest of the way out. So since something shorted in this set, the filter capacitor here and caused the fusible resistor to burn open. I just went ahead and replaced the 
diode with a new one in 4007 and we're back in operation sort of I've got it turned wide open I think that cartridge is a little weak so but as far as the amplifier it should it seems to be working fine I've tested everything in it and everything seems to be okay okay here we are as you can tell the drive wheel has a den in it from it being left in gear and you're not using the record player you're supposed to put the speed selector in neutral but most people didn't do that and it works but I can tell the cartridge is a little weak it's wide open it should be louder than that and of course the drive mechanism also needs some service Yeah, that's not too good. Here's the original cartridge, a Varco SN65, and honestly, these were really not that great. I'm surprised this one still works at all. The suspension still seems to be pretty soft, but it just doesn't have very good output. So probably what will happen to this, we will install the modern day Fan Steel P226 cartridge with a flip over needle for LP and 78, and then we'll have to add a little preamp circuit to the existing design to give it a little more boost since uh, this cartridge is a three volt cartridge and the P226 is somewhere between a half a volt and a volt, so, but the trade-off is with that modification, this will be a better record player than it ever was, so, we'll dig up a cartridge and then we'll proceed. Alright, scratch the preamp idea for right now. I tried the little FET circuit that I've used in other phonographs, and for some reason it didn't seem to be too happy in this. It, the thing just squealed like crazy and very little gain, so I don't, I don't know what's going on, and frankly I'm not in the mood to try to figure out what's going on, so I just uh, added a cathode bypass capacitor across the cathode resistor for the output tube, 33 microfarad, 150 volts, and that gave us a little bit of a boost. It's a little better now. Somebody said he came from New Orleans where he got fired over a Cajun queen and a crash is blown from a huge... And that's all I'm going to do to it right now. Just like with the some of the other cheap stuff that I get in over here, this is not something that I'm going to use on a regular basis. It's just more of a novelty than any, anything else. Uh, concerning the idler wheel, I might send it off one day and have it rebuilt. I might wait until some ragged out cardboard case kitty record player comes in here with a good wheel on it and swap it out there again I don't want to spend 28 bucks plus shipping on a wheel for this I'm getting real cheap in my old age and speaking of idler wheels I'll leave you with a, a story from about 20 years ago before I say goodbye there was a TV shop in town and he was a bit of a shyster he all he was concerned with was making money he wasn't too concerned about his quality of workmanship well somebody brought in one of those early 80s El Cheapo all-in-one stereos with the Matt Houston record changer that was something similar to a BSR it's what a lot of companies started using when BSR started going under well the Matt Houston changer used a rubber idler wheel that would literally melt and turn to goo and and leave a huge mess inside of the unit. Anybody who was in the service business back then knows exactly what I'm talking about, I'm sure. Usually what I did on those was I'd clean all the mess up and install a wheel from a junk BSR changer. They're a direct replacement. Well, this clown, he installed some kind of out of round wheel out of a VCR or some device it wasn't something that come out of a record player 
and told the guy, well, that's all I can, that's the best I can do. Well, as you can imagine, when the record played, it was wow, 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 wow. Now, me personally, I'd be ashamed to let anything go out of the shop like that. If I couldn't fix it correctly, I'd just tell the customer that it couldn't, uh, that I couldn't do anything with it. But, like I said, this clown's only in it for the, was only in it for the money. He's out of business now. Wonder why. And there's no telling what he charged that guy for the botched repair. Well, anyway, the guy brought it to me. I just took an idler wheel off of a BSR changer and stuck it on there, and the thing played perfectly, and I didn't even charge the guy nothing. I sort of felt sorry for him after getting taken to the cleaners by the other guy, so, you know, that's that. I helped him out. If any of you back in the day flipped over your big bad John 45, you got this. Won't go hunting with you, Jake, but I'll go chasing women. But anyway, I cleaned the idler wheel a little more and it helped a little bit, but it really does need a new wheel. As far as our preamp, I think what we need to do is put the preamp between the cartridge and the input of the volume control in previous attempts. We've installed the preamp between the output of the volume control and the control grid of the amplifier tube. Well, since this set uses a loudness compensated volume control, there really needs to be a hot signal going into the volume control for the loudness compensation to work properly. So if I should decide to do that down the road, then I think that's what I'll do. Here we are with a 78. It does pretty good. Yeah, you can really tell the wow and flutter on one of these uh, 33 and a third RPM instrumental records. Get me some new test records. I know everybody's getting tired of me alternating between the worn out Black Sabbath album and this uh, Hap Palmer Elementary Educational album that came from my old elementary school. But yeah, that's about all I've got for this right now. Maybe one day I'll have the wheel rebuilt, maybe not. Maybe one day I'll work on a preamp to get a little more volume out of this, and then again, maybe not. Because frankly, the money I would spend on this, I could spend the same amount of money fixing up a better quality record player. I'll admit that this one is better quality than most one tube wonders, but it's still a one tube wonder record player. And how many of those do I have over here already? A bunch of them. The main thing this has going for it is it's a Zenith, and it was made in 1968, so it's probably their last tube record player. All right, that's it for now. Hope you got something out of this, and we'll do something else again later.